Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Heart-Based Business Show. I am your host, Dr. Shirlene Reeves, and we are going to talk about happiness today. And I don't want you to think, oh, I'm already happy, I don't have to hear this. You might be surprised at what you do here because so many people don't realize that they aren't happy. They're just going through life and they're feeling pretty miserable without even realizing it. So today we are going to talk about some happy habits that you can utilize if you are feeling kind of down on a day and it will pick you right up. So I'm excited about this discussion today and I think you're gonna love the psychologist that we have on the show that will talk to you about it. So hang tight for just a minute and I will be right back with you. And welcome back to this fun show of happiness. And uh, hopefully we'll have some laughter in it too, uh, because I think happiness at this time is so important. We've been going through some really rough times and I know a lot of my clients have been really depressed and sad and they're just having a rough time. And then once we have a chance to chat, everything works out. And I'm sure that happens with the guests that I'm gonna have on today too because that's what we're gonna talk about is how to bring yourself out of feeling a dump and a frump, okay? So our guest today, she is a practicing therapist, a national speaker, an educator, and certified positive psychology coach. And she has her master's degrees in counseling and adjunct in the social work department at Rutgers University. And she's written three books and she's been featured in various publications and on TV and internet shows. So what I wanna do is get to her right now. I don't wanna waste any more time because she is really good with happiness, resiliency, stress, and helping parents with positive aging and anxiety and depression in teens and adults. So I think you're gonna love what she has to say. So let me bring on Diane Lang right now. Hi, Diane, welcome to the show. Hi. I'm so glad you're with me. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So, you know, one of the things that I think is really confusing is that people don't realize whether they're happy or they're not happy. And they don't even know that they're challenged with something that makes them unhappy, which I kind of find very interesting. So I wondered if you would address this. Why are they unhappy and they don't even know it? Well, so I agree. There's always clients who come in and say, you know, I don't really know what's wrong. You know, they'll start off like, I'm here because I'm just not myself or I just feel like things aren't the way they used to be, but they don't really know why. And a lot of them will describe themselves as blah, lost, stuck, not clinical words, but really how they're feeling. They've lost enthusiasm for life, motivation. They do what they need to do. You know, they go to work, they take care of their families, they go to school, whatever they need, but they just lost that, you know, love for life. And they just don't know how to get it back. And they don't realize that happiness plays a role in that. And that people can have what we call dysthymia, which is just mild depression, which sometimes is even harder to notice because you still function. You don't get down into like this rock bottom where you can't function. You do what you need to do. And a lot of people go, well, how could I not be happy? I mean, I do everything I need to do. Maybe I'm just tired. Maybe I'm just burnt out. And they don't realize that, yeah, you just might not be that happy. And again, there's many reasons why people, you know, aren't happy. It could be situational, something going on in their life. It could be global, like what we're dealing with today with, the pandemic, a second wave on its way, the election, the holidays not looking the same, seasonal disorder. I mean, there's many reasons why. And it could be a mix, too, of different situations at the time. But if people don't, you know, really pay attention to it, they can really easily be in denial and avoid it. Or we're really good at numbing ourselves so we don't feel anything, right? I mean, I've had clients come in and say, I just spent the whole weekend just being on Netflix binging. 
And it's not because you needed a day off. I mean, we all need a day off and it's fine to, you know, read a book, watch Netflix. That's great. But when you're using something as an avoidance tool to kind of numb out from life, that's a different story. And I think people don't realize that or they don't want to admit it either, because if they admit I'm not happy, then they have to go deeper and look into the root of the problem. And that's scary because if you figure it out, it might mean that you have to change. And while we know, right, you have clients, how many people want change? Even positive change, I have people go, no. I'm yeah, no change for me. I don't, I'm right. okay. <laughs> I'm right here. You don't need to do anything. You know, at least I, I've had a client who just said to me, well, I'm not happy, but at least, you know, I know what to expect. I know how to handle this. You know, stepping outside your comfort zone is so scary for so many people. But the thing is, the only constant in the world is change. And if you don't embrace it, if you don't lean into it, and you let fear paralyze you, you're going to get stuck, stale, stagnant, and that leads to depression. So you don't want to go down that road. So we want to think about asking yourself, and what I have my clients do is literally asking themselves, how do they define happiness? What does happiness look like? What does it feel like? Because honestly, it's completely individual for everybody. Mm -hmm. What makes me happy will not make you happy. And that's okay. And the thing I get from parents is that a lot of parents will say, well, I don't know what makes me happy because it's not important. I have to take care of everybody else. You know, I'm in the sandwich generation. I have kids, I have parents, I got a boss. What do you want me to do? And the truth is, they think of it as being selfish or self-centered. And part of, you know, being happy is self-care. It's taking care of yourself. And the truth is you can't give what you don't have. So if you're not feeling good mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and you're burning out, you can't be the best parent, the best, you know, whatever you do for a living, social worker, teacher, you know, whatever it is. You can't be the best friend, family member. You won't have it in you to do. And the other part is we are in a pandemic. And the one thing we don't want to do is lower our immune system because of that. Plus, you know, it's winter time over here in the States and we're starting to hit that cold flu sinus season. So you want to keep your immune system healthy. And one of the big factors of that is stress. I mean, Harvard research came out 90% of doctor visits to your general practitioner are stress related. You know, mm. stress plays a huge role in everything we do. So it's really important to become aware. So, you know, sitting down and asking yourself, how do I define happiness? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Reminding yourself it's not selfish to take care of you first because then you'll be the best parent if you have kids or the best caretaker, provider, whatever your role is. And really looking into that because what happens as we get older you know, if you look at kids, right, young kids, or even like my college students have been teaching for years at Montclair State and Rutgers for years, my college students will be very self-absorbed. It's where you're supposed to be. It's, you know, you're figuring out who you are, where do you want to go? What does life look like? But then as you pass that stage and you start hitting adulthood, right, where, you know, you start taking care of others, you got a mortgage, you got a job, you have kids, your happiness becomes based on everybody else and you kind of forget about your own happiness. So asking yourself, well, what does happiness even look like? Or having my clients write out a list of the top five things that cultivate happiness for them is sometimes the biggest struggle. And I've had clients say, I can't believe how hard this is. Like, I don't even know what makes me happy. I know what makes my spouse, my kids, my, you know, my best friend, my boss, but me, I, I haven't done anything for myself for 20 years. So really just taking some time to evaluate and figure out what does make you happy. And that's really a good place to start. And then when you make that list of like the top four to five things that cultivate happiness just for you, then it's looking at your schedule, your calendar and going, does it match? Because if you have a list of what makes you happy, but you haven't done it, it's not going to go anywhere. I had a client, I still remember this. It was 2018. She started with me in November and she was one of those who said, I feel blah, what's going on? And I sent her, I gave her homework. <clears> I sent her home. And they said, I want you to write a list of the 10, uh, not 10, I'm sorry, the top five things that make you happy. And she comes back two weeks later and she goes, this was a struggle. I could only get four things. I said, okay, what's your number one? And she said, I love taking a hot bath. She's like, I have one of those really big like hot tubs. I have candles, I have music, it's, it's great. I can shut the door, lock the kids, the dog, the husband out, it's, it's self-care. 
it sounded wonderful. I wanted her to leave so I could go take a bath. I mean, that's how she explained it. And then I said to her, now remember, it's November. I said, when was the last time you took a bath? And I should have known because she had to look up to think. She was like, I know I took one this year. And that's the problem. If that's the number one thing that gives you self-care and happiness, but you're not putting it on the calendar and you're not doing it, then you're not making yourself a priority and you're not getting the things you need for self-care, which is happiness. So defining it, looking at it, writing a list, putting it on your calendar, making sure you do some of it is so important. So that's just a good place to start and really diving into the work, but knowing it's not going to be as easy as you think. It's kind of the same hard question when people say as they get older, the number one question is, what do I want to do when I grow up? And these mm -hmm. are people in their 40s or 50s. You think it sounds simple, just like happiness. And you said that in the beginning. Wow, it sounds simple. It's not. So don't be, you know, upset or judge yourself if it takes some time to really think about it. That's really normal. Yeah, the, you, you're you right. If they don't think about it, they just go through their day. I always say they get up in the morning, they feed the kids, they do their thing, they go to work, they do their work all day. Then they go home, feed the kids, go to bed, get up in the morning, do the same thing over and over <laughs> and over again. Groundhog Day. <laughs> yes, and that's enough to depress you in the first place, right? <laughs> and you do this day after day after day, although now most, a lot of people are working at home, so they don't even have to drive. Yeah. So they don't, they're, that's good and that's bad because right. they, don't, they don't get the alone time in the car that they used to have, and, but they don't have to deal with the traffic, but they got <laughs> the kids at home. <laughs> But, I, you know, I kind of laugh and say everybody got their wish because they kept saying, I don't want to go to work. I don't want to sit in the traffic. I want to spend more time with the family, uh, you know, and they got their wish. And now they yeah. complain still. You know, it's funny. I had a client say to me, and I'm in the New Jersey area right near New York City. And I had a few clients, but the first client I remember saying it to me was somewhere in the summer. And he said, I never thought I would say this, but I miss the traffic. Mm -hmm. My traffic was my downtime <laughs> before I went home. It was listening to my podcast, my music. I've lost that. And people are getting what we call family burnout because we weren't, you know, expected to or used to spending 365 days a year together. It's a lot for people. And they, you know, if you're not taking care of yourself to begin with, you know, and you're not on that priority list, now put all the pressure of having to work, raise your kids at home. 24 hours a day, seven days a week without a break. And it's taking people to that real brink of burnout. You know, mm -hmm. we're seeing pandemic burnout, we're seeing family burnout. And they're both, you know, valid and understandable, but we have to work on getting out of it because, you know, we have a second wave on the way and we don't have a vaccine yet. So this could go on until spring or summer. So it's yes. important that we really work on being happier and not just for this, because it will pass, right? Everything is temporary. But there's always going to be problems because life's a roller coaster, right? That up and down, constant is change. So getting kind of used to being able to deal with it or being more resilient. And the good news is the happier you are, the more resilient you are naturally. That's true. So they true. kind of work hand in hand. So mm -hmm. when you're working on one, you get the bonus of the other, which I really like. You know, I love these clients that I get that say, especially the guys, <laughs> they'll call and go, I need you to fix my wife. <laughs> I, I knew you had to have those or people fix too. fix my kids. Fix my yes. kids is a big one. Fix anybody but me, right? Yeah. Anybody Absolutely. but me. And you made a really good point in that if we, if we want to be happy, we have to look at why we aren't. And if we aren't, we have to do something about it. That's the thing, Absolutely. Yeah. but it's not about that other guy. It's not about the kids. It's not about your wife or your husband. It's about you and how you perceive what is happening and how you deal with it. That's what it's about. Instead yeah. of just saying, oh, it's everybody else's fault. You know, I know so many, <laughs> so many people that come to me and they're always blaming everybody else, but they don't see their part in it. And when you don't see your part in it, you can't be happy. It's just not possible. It's true. You know, I've had a lot, I've actually had clients who've come in, you know, booked a session and then said, you know, I'm not here for me. I'm here because my wife's not happy. You know, my spouse is not happy. My kids, I, I want you to help them. 
I actually had a client who came in and said to me, you know, I, I want you, you need to fix my daughter, but she doesn't want help. Yeah, you know, good luck. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's really knowing this. Yeah. You can only control yourself. You can't control other people. And if you try to control them, it's just going to be like banging your head into a brick wall over and over again and expecting a different response. You're going to frustrate yourself and get angry. You're going to, you know, cause distance in the relationship because it's an impossibility. It's not going to happen. You're setting yourself up for failure. So you want to work on what you have the ability to work on. And you want to ask yourself on any situation you're working through is, do I have control of this situation? Is this in my control? And what you have the ability to control is yourself and how you react and respond to situations. You have control of your mindset, how you think, your patterns, your beliefs. You have the ability to, you know, control what you digest as in media, TV, radio, newspapers, social media, video games, who you spend your time with. And all of those play a role in your happiness. So, you know, one is thinking about the group of people you spend the most time with, you know, doing an emotional detox, thinking about the handful of people, the four to six people you spend the most time with. If they're negative and draining and toxic, it's going to bring you down. And I've had a lot of clients think that they could go in and they're the positive one and they'll shift to everybody. And I just want you to know positivity and negativity spread different differently. Now, moods and emotions are completely contagious scientifically. We know that, but we all have what's called the negative bias and that's inherited. It's genetic. Everybody has it. And what it does is it makes you kind of focus in on the negative, lean into it, see it more, and kind of stay there. So for us to be positive, we have to be a little bit more mindful. And that's really important. And one place you have the ability to be mindful is who do you spend your time with? How do they make you feel? Do they empower you? Or do they bring you down? Do they drain you? And we're not talking about the person who's just having a bad day or, you know, your best friend who's going through something really horrible, just lost a loved one. We're talking about people who've been like this forever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're the victim. Yeah. They always, the why me? They, they don't want help. They don't want change. And you said it. If someone doesn't want to change, you can't help them. So working on what you have the control over, who you spend your time with, then watching out about your mindset. Because, again, we have the ability to control our mindset. And, you know, the important number I always want to put out there, not sound like, you know, I'm a psych professor, even though I am, but, you know, it's that nature versus nurture, which has shifted so much in the last 20 years. But knowing this, nature versus nurture means this, 50% of who you are, your personality is genetic. 10% is circumstances, things that happen outside of our reach that we can't prepare or plan for, but they impact us. But the 40% is the huge number because the 40% is nurtured. It's everything around you that you learned, it's your environment. And that means you have the control over it. So that means 40% of who you are is in your control. And that 40% includes your habits, your beliefs and patterns. And you know, it's hard to change them. I'm not saying, oh yeah, it happens like this. You know, we've been spending years and years on autopilot where we just go and go and do and do. We don't focus in on it. And mm -hmm. our beliefs, patterns, and habits have re really formed them between like birth and seven years old, really early. So to change them, we have to be self-aware. We have to want to change. And then we have to put the work into it. And I think that's the hardest part because most people fear change, even positive change. They're like, oh, no, thanks. I'll stay exactly where I am. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, once you become self-aware, then that means you have to take responsibility. And you have to own it and then you have to make changes and that's hard for people but it's the only way through it you know is to realize this is not working and what changes can i make to make my life better and where i want it to be and we all have that ability to cultivate more happiness more mindfulness in our lives where we can be much happier than where we are today even in a circumstance like a pandemic you know i think a big part of it is expectations because the expectations are what create the challenges in a relationship. And I love to say, you know, people run around like two year olds, right? They're, they're doing their two year old thing and they have all this neediness and all these expectations and they get into these relationships who uh, also have neediness and expectations, then that doesn't work out. And then they say, oh, thank God that's over with. Then they toddle off to find another two-year-old 
and do the same thing all over again. The pattern, right? Yes, that's the pattern. And I think the expectations, if you want to make changes, that is the first thing that has to adjust are your expectations because they're way too high for most people. They're just outrageously high. I want this, I want that, I want the other thing. And when you say to them, well, what do you suppose your spouse wants? Or what do you suppose your partner wants? And they don't know. They have no idea what they want. And so how can they meet those expectations? It's impossible. And they never talk about expectations. It's just assumed women do this thing that I just love. And I'm sure you know all about it, where they think that the guy should just know. Why does <laughs> he know? Yeah. Yes, yes. He's supposed to know what I'm thinking. He's supposed to know what I want. And, you know, I'm just not happy unless I get it. But then yeah. he never ever hears about this. So he just gets into trouble without even realizing why. And I think that's why so many guys walk around shell shocked <laughs> a lot of the time. <laughs> well, that's just, the, you know, a lot of people have such a hard time communicating. You know, yes. they have that fear of communication, the lack of like knowing how they didn't watch their parents, the fear of rejection, hurting people. So they just hold it in. And then we create a story in our head, which we're even better at. And this is for men and women, but women tend to do it more is, you know, we expect something, we don't tell anybody. And then when it doesn't happen, we get upset. And when it's not happening, we start creating a story of why. We make mm -hmm. an assumption based on past fears or what we've seen before in different relationships. And then we make up this whole story in our head that's not even based on truth or fact. And then it makes it even worse. So, I mean, yeah, if you want to have a good relationship, you can't with, you know, expectations that are not realistic. If you don't have the communication and share it, I have seen so many of like, well, what do you mean you don't know? We've been together five <laughs> years. How do you not know? But they, and they don't want to tell you because they get upset thinking, why should I have to tell you? But the truth is we're all different people and we have to tell everybody how we feel. If they mm -hmm. don't, they're not even aware of it. And, you know, most of us are very self-absorbed. It's the world we live in. And I hate to say that because... I wish it's we true. Were. It's but true, it's, though. Right. We're so wrapped up. We're not very community based here in America, at least. Mm -mm. You know, we're really based on, are you OK? You know, what are you doing? And maybe your immediate family. Like, of course, we care about our spouses and our kids and our parents. But we still put ourselves first, which in one way is good because we need to take care of ourselves. But we need to think outside of ourselves. We need to have that concern of, OK, you know, I need to do this for me. But what do you need as well? It has to be a reciprocal and that is lacking. And, you know, one thing I love about the pandemic or even a situation like 9-11, which are both horrific, is that it brings people together and you see so much of the other side. And there's mm -hmm. always two sides to every situation, right? Yes. There's always. There's always a positive and a negative and they're both 100% true. But it's which one do you put your focus on? You can put your focus on that, oh, my God, it's another second wave. The hospitals are getting overwhelmed. People are sick. I'm stuck inside again. Or you can go. All right, we, we plan for this, but at least we have technology and the hospitals and doctors are well prepared this time and we know what to do. Both stories are completely true, but it's which one do you want to put your focus on and which mm -hmm. one you put your focus on will shift your whole mood and day. So it's really about which side and paying attention and being mindful. But yeah, expressing yourself and telling people, even if it's scary and you have to be vulnerable in a relationship where you can't have a true authentic one anyway. So it is always taking a risk. But what I love about the taking a risk, and I'm just going to throw it in here. It's a really important happiness tool. Every day, ask yourself, how can I step outside my comfort zone today? What is one new thing I can do each day? Produce more happy chemicals, show fear that you're not afraid, get that extra variety and creativity in your life and grow. You know, if we stay stuck in our comfort zones, that's where we get stuck and stale. But every time that I grow and expand, that's when I start really becoming me and showing fear that, yeah, it's scary. I feel you, but I'm going to let this pass and do it anyway. So do little micro steps, even if it's trying a new food, a new drink. If you read fiction, read nonfiction, take a walk in a, you know, in a different park, step outside your comfort zone, do it once a day, challenge yourself every day. You'll be surprised how it lifts your happiness just by doing something a little differently than your norm. And that's really important. And that's one way you can create more happiness just every day. 
How can I step outside my comfort zone or how can I challenge myself or what's one new thing I can do? And that's just an easy step we can all do and really, you know, make our lives just a little bit happier and a little more fun. Yeah. And that's, what's really important is having a little bit more fun, you know, <laughs> even if it's a pillow fight <laughs> or if it's just putting music on and dancing around in the family room or the living room and letting the kids participate, you know, let them see something that's unique and different that you haven't done before and they'll like it. They'll have a good time with it. But, uh, you know, and sometimes you can even sit down and play a game with them. And that's kind of fun, too. Or tell stories. My grandkids are always asking me for stories. Tell me another story. I need another story. And sometimes I get, and I get to the point where I, they've got three. I, you, you owe me three now. And I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> how am I going to do that? How am I going to do all of those three? <laughs> but you know, sometimes you can get them to help you with whatever it is and it becomes yeah. more fun. Absolutely. So I like what you're saying, Diane, that we just have to think of new ways to step out of our comfort zone that makes a difference to us. We have to cut back on the expectations that we have regarding others and start communicating about what our needs are so that we can uh, have a positive relationship and not just think that other people should know things because they just don't. It's just that simple. Yep, exactly. Couldn't agree with you more. Well, do you have a final thought you'd like to share with us? Well, I just want everybody to know that, again, you can be happier. And my last thought on this that I would love to share is just, you know, a really simple way to be happier. And if everybody can do one thing from this interview is just to add gratitude to your day. Mm -hmm. And I have my clients do it at night. You can do whenever you want, but just a simple thing. You can write it, you can say it out loud, say it in your head again, work around you, what works best, but ask yourself, what are two to three things I am grateful for that happened today? Search your day for those little gifts and blessings because gratitude to me is like a superpower because not only does it cultivate happiness because it's a positive emotion, it cultivates mindfulness. So if you do it at night, it helps you sleep. And the thing is, within about two and a half, three months, which is what we really need for something to become a full-blown autopilot habit, you'll notice a shift in your view. With gratitude, it allows you to see the good in a bad situation. And once you're able to do that, you started to retrain your brain a little. So just by doing gratitude, it'll take you two minutes a night You'll go to bed with good thoughts, which will help you sleep. You'll wake up in a better mood. It reduces stress because it's mindfulness. There's not one bad side effect. So if there's anything you can do, leave here. Yep, challenge yourself. Do something new. Set realistic expectations for others. Learn to communicate and be grateful. And I really think that, you know, that just those few things alone can help shift your life just a little bit. And just a little bit makes a huge difference. Well, Diane, thank you so much for being with us today. You gave us some thank really you. fabulous information. And everybody, I just want to say thank you so much for being with us today. I hope you got some good takeaways out of what we shared with you today. Because if you can shift your way of thinking, it will completely change your life. And Diane gave you some great little tips. Gratitude is such a big deal. And it makes such a difference in your life. And you know, those biggest things that happen that are the most challenging for you also help you grow the most and help you grow the fastest. So no matter what situation you are in, look for the good in it so that you can utilize it in the future. So thanks for being with me. I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Have a great week. Take care, everybody, and be safe.